What's your favorite way to pass time during your fast? Watch YouTube. Go to the gym. Uh. Oh! I don't know what happened. <laughs> <laughs> that was not a good sound effect. When you get like you shock yourself, I'm to not pass proud time. of that sound effect. <laughs> I actually, no, like. Uh, so what's your answer since you didn't answer? I do a lot. Like I get so much done. Yeah. When okay. you don't have to worry about food, mm-hmm. because it becomes an excuse. When mm-hmm. I'm working, I'm like looking at the time. I'm like, yeah, I think I'll eat now. I'll go here. <laughs> yeah. And, eat. and it takes up so much time. And then mm-hmm. picking what food you want to eat. Right. And then like, it, and then you get lazy after you eat. True. It's too much, but like. I just try to stay productive. <laughs> you said go to the gym. Like you've been going hard to the gym in the mo- right in the morning too. Well, it's half the times I go in the yeah, morning. Yeah, let's just be dehydrated. For half the time is no, not like most, only like two hours. Most of the time I go at um, in the afternoon. So I get off work at six and I'll go there by six uh, thirty. Okay. So from six thirty to seven, I'll fast. Time. By the time I get home, I open it. Dang. It's the best. It's what did like, you say? You do? I said watch YouTube. Mm-hmm. Mine's a non-productive thing. Actually, it's productive. It's a. It depends what you're watching. Depends mm-hmm. what you're watching. Yeah. Yeah. I've been watching, you know, Vine compilations, so that's not... So, no, I'm just... <laughs> what's your, taking notes. How's your guys' this fast been treating you? It's good. That's good. I it's think good. Uh, I was going to ask, what do you guys think is the, the toughest part? For me, yeah. it's being tired, like, trying to get over that, uh-huh. being tired. Um, mine's just drinking water, but that's just gym-related. Mine's just, like, being positive, like, in... You can't uh, be positive? No, 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 oh, not, not into <laughs> externally, because I stay, like, roasting people and, like, stuff like that. Oh, okay. And just, like, trying not to be mm. mean... And just, you know. It's the same thing with cursing, too. Like, well, that's not a problem for me. That's a huge problem for you. Yeah, no, but I haven't <laughs> been. And music, I haven't been listening to music like oh, that. Oh, really? Oh, that's because you haven't, uh, I haven't played you anything new recently. <laughs> Amber, last time, <laughs> she was like, oh, yeah, like I'm only listening to Nasheeds, which is like Islamic uh, songs, songs yeah. and stuff. Um, and then I, I was like, oh, did you hear this new Nav song? And then she was listening to the rest of Ramadan. Okay, so you shouldn't have showed me that Nav song, and it was, like, really good, so... I'm know. the culprit. Yeah, I, I tried quitting fault. music, for, and I think, like, 15... I went 15 days last Ramadan, and mm. I was, like, getting depressed. And I was you like... Can, wait, I was you like, can't get depressed in Ramadan. I was like, I have, to, I have to listen to music. And I played, like, music, and I was just like, okay. Oh, good. What? Yeah. The devil. <laughs> you have to the listen devil. to Nishi. The devil speaks. It feels like you're True. listening to music. Are they but on you're Spotify? Not. Is uh, there like a playlist? <laughs> yeah, they're, so they're everywhere. They're, yeah, oh, okay. they're literally Dean everywhere. Dean Squad actually has like a whole Nishi album. Yeah. And Oman. Oh, yeah. Oman, yeah. yeah Frost's brother. I didn't, brother I didn't know Oman last year, so. Mm. Oman could have saved me last year. He could have. <laughs> I listened to this uh, um, the song of his. Is it called a Nishi of his every morning when I'm on my way to work? Okay. Thank, all right, thank you guys for tuning in to an episode <laughs> of Strange Flavors. My name is Shimmer. I'm Faraz. My name is Amber. And this is brought to you by Aleph Theory. This is the strangest and greatest podcast in the game, and it is Ramadan, so it is a holy episode. So as we talk away, we're just losing. Uh, <laughs> or, more and we're more energy. More thirsty. Yeah, we're getting more thirsty, and yeah. But we're also thirsty for your messages <laughs> and <laughs> emails. <laughs> On, uh, you can email us or send us your music at strangeflavorspodcast at gmail.com. You can find us everywhere on SoundCloud, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, etc. And yeah. And, and yeah. Uh, I want to I wanna shout out somebody who sent us a nice message recently. Um, Azadi? Az- Whoa. XO. That's me. She said, just wanted to say that I love your podcast and what you guys do. You guys always have interesting topics that I basically binge heard all your recent ones. Whoa. Uh, keep doing what you do. Much love from Toronto. Thank you, Azadi XO. Shout out Toronto. All the X's and O's back at you. Yeah. Um, six six six. Um, and also like, <laughs> look at this picture pop. It's is it. Right? It's A Z D X O. Whoa, you didn't like it. Um, that's a strange flavors account. Oh, I um, like it. <laughs> also, we have merch. Um, strange flavors, Ronopono, I Live Theory merch, all online. Uh, I think there's only like one or two things left uh, for. So- the Aleph Theory they're on sale. merch, they're on sale for 50%, so get it before it's completely gone. Yes. Thank you for everybody that's uh, bought it so far. And uh, please be sure to leave us a review on the Apple Podcast app. It really helps us out. Subscribe to us on YouTube. We're on the come up, people. Mm-hmm. Yep. And we're, and we're going to keep going. So um, thank you for listening. Um, you know, uh, something that I recently realized that like people that aren't on social media and stuff um, kind of go through, like that, that FOMO of 
of like not knowing like internet memes and stuff mm-hmm. was through Game of Thrones. So I don't watch Game of Thrones, mm. and my entire Twitter timeline is just filled with it. Mm-hmm. And I'm just I like, don't know who Arya is, but I'm really proud of her. <laughs> like, <laughs> like I'm just saying, she seemed like she did a good job. Oh, like yeah. Drake even shouted, I think her out in and his like, like Billboard yeah. Music Award, which by the way he won 27. What the heck? <laughs> um, which is the most ever. But yeah, like do you you watch Game of Thrones, right? Yeah. And, and so it was just Avengers and Game of Thrones in the last, like, month. And mm. I'm just like... And I don't watch either. Oh, <laughs> yeah. that's tough. Yeah. Whoa. So you must be feeling what I'm feeling on, like, an extreme. I just deleted all my social media apps. <laughs> Wait, why? Yeah, every watch reference every- to everything is <laughs> that. <laughs> Literally. But, but for Avengers and stuff, like, you just have to sit there through even three hours was long. But Game of Thrones, like, that's so long. I can't do that. Okay, I went through, like, episode? the first an episode, hour? and an it was, like, five minutes. And how many episodes were there? too many things happened. Uh, it's on the... Eight Eighth season, and how many? And ten, ten episodes. And how long? Ten are they hours. That eighty but hours. It's been going on for like seven years. So that's years. crazy. I, can you watch it right now and then, like, the last season, just like know what's going on? Yeah, yeah, you can, but it'll take you a while. How do like, you feel about people the, have been doing that? How do you feel about the uh, like the hip hop tracks and stuff like that in the new? I saw the track I mean, list. They're not playing it in the show. So, oh, okay. Yeah, okay. so it's just like a soundtrack. You know, like movies and stuff. Like a lot of the those yeah. soundtrack songs aren't in the movies. Just, oh, it's not like you know in Bollywood sort of like where they just like all cut and start singing. Yeah, that music. that um, what's it <laughs> no, called? The, um, like <laughs> the the one song that um, A. R. Rahman made for the Avengers. I was expecting to see that. Uh, uh, he's he's he's, a, he's like one of the biggest Indian producers. He's won like an Oscar as well, um, and been nominated for multiple things. But um. He made a Bollywood type song for the Avengers. Is that I was the one expecting that to yeah. Yeah, yeah. I was expecting that to play when like all of them showed up. <laughs> Why? I don't know. I just thought that's how, how it works. Maybe in the India version. Yeah. Also, there was a what's what's the um is it is dwarf a, a bad thing to say? No. Yeah, it's little people. You, you know say what? little people. Yeah. Dwarf is okay. a proper term, right? Um, I remember you telling me it's derogatory. I think it is. Okay. I well, thought it's like the usage of the word, but sure, go ahead. It depends. I don't know, but. Peter, what's his name? Peter Dinklage. There's a Pakistani version that looks just like him. Have you seen this? <laughs> yeah, yeah I, saw, I saw you send it. Yeah, yeah like he, uh, they're using him for commercials with references to Game of Thrones in Pakistan. And oh, that's ba- his only job. Pakistanis love Game of Thrones. Wait, really? what? They love Game of Thrones. So there, there's this like app called Patari and all that other yeah. stuff. They always post Game of Thrones memes. And hmm. like it's Urdu version, and they've made like Bollywood remixes. They love Game of Thrones. That's, That's crazy. <laughs> That's hmm. crazy. And um, so it's, you can tell by this what Frost just told us that there's a guy who looks like him and is getting. He looks just like him. And he's getting a lot of like, what cloud I guess or whatever. And they're only using him for commercials regarding yeah. Game of Thrones. Somebody sent me this um, like stats thing of people who are naming their children after Game of Thrones names, <laughs> and like the number one name that they're naming their children after is Arya. Wow. Yeah. Hmm. That's yeah. Int- your uh, niece's name, name is yeah, Arya. My niece's name, and it's spelled that same. I asked way. your brother if that was the reason. He was like, "Oh, I actually didn't name her." No. Was, <laughs> so I was like, it's oh. "Hilarious." Yeah. Um, Shamir, I want to talk about something. You haven't been here um, for the intro, but you ended your vlogs recently. Mm. Yep. Uh, how does? Uh, uh, why? Yeah. Why? <laughs> <laughs> um, I guess there's like a million reasons why, and um, yeah, what's the, the main reason? One, it's just like. It's slowly building up, and like the you, like I've started to realize after like a hundred episodes um, that the YouTube algorithm doesn't really like support that kind of content mm-hmm. anymore. Like um, they really support like watch time and all that stuff. And mm-hmm. when it's like a bunch of random skits, like some people are like, oh, "I like the skit," mm-hmm. or maybe they click out of it mm-hmm. or whatnot. So watch time is just like what I clickbait it. They mm-hmm. get that. They look very, for that. They look for that. And so what a lot of videos now are like a specific theme and that's like the whole video and those do a lot better. Um, so that's like one main reason. And two, like, I think I was want... a lot of like time and pressure. I mean, I love doing it. Okay. Like it's, it was awesome yeah. and it was amazing. But as we're getting busier and stuff, mm. like it's more pressure to like try to get people to like do a skit for me or something sure. like that. And that's just like a lot of work to put in and I want to put everyone in. So that's just a lot of work. So if I lived closer, I think um, I would be able to do that. So it's basically like ending while it's like amazing. Hmm. Mm. How do you feel since ending it? Honestly, I was really upset at first, but I was like, I feel like I have to do this. Okay. Just to like venture off and Mm -hmm. stuff like that and 
just experiment other you, ways. You posted a new video of you having actually our guest on today's episode, um, and it was like a different type of video. Do you think that you're going to venture off into that type of direction and like just kind of exp- experimenting hmm. many different? So that's one style, one idea that I had, and I was just like, if any idea I have, I'll just like, hey, let me try to pursue that mm. and do that's that. Dope. But um, it's like that's how I started the vlog is just trying new things mm. so I think it was cool that you had this dedicated audience that were like specifically there like mm-hmm. to tune in for your vlogs yeah. and I feel like if you yeah. that was kind of a goal or something I feel like you really accomplished that and went sure. above and beyond yeah and earn and definitely lived up to the title vlog god yeah <laughs> it's crazy so there's really... so many people that were upset too yeah and I really appreciate like every support and all the support. That's why you, that's why you gotta cut it off when it's at the peak. <laughs> <laughs> that's why that's why people love Tupac and Biggie. They were like at their peak and then they just died. You know, okay. people don't respect. Okay. I'm serious. That's that's a thing. Like right. people are like, yeah, Eminem's washed out. Yeah, Jay Z, this and that. And, so just you know. die while you're young. Yeah, just at the at the top and just pull the plug. <laughs> that's the way to go. So if you want to see the vlogs come back. Hopefully, uh, you fund us enough that we get to move together or something. I like how mm-hmm. you said fund us enough <laughs> so that I can... Really... No, just kidding. No, um, I'm, I'm excited for whatever ventures you go on from here. And, and sure. this dude's creative, so he's going he's gonna to definitely keep entertaining you. Mm-hmm. But also, on the note of Instagram, um, I heard that people are getting these betas that, like, they're removing their likes. Oh, yeah. What? Yeah. Like, it doesn't... Well, it doesn't show you mm-hmm. uh, it removes the publicly fake ones, how right? many people... Oh. No, 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 no. It doesn't show you how many people liked your photo. Or I guess it shows you maybe, but it doesn't show anybody else. So then there's, because there's a lot of people struggling with like, you know, being accepted and, and uh, anxiety and depression because of social media likes. And Instagram is like the front mm-hmm. runner of this thing. Yeah. So I think they're testing it with people. To, to remove, so, so I, like say if I look at Shamir's, I wouldn't be able to see who liked his How many his likes he has. Oh, how many? Yeah. Hmm. And I think we've talked about this like a while yeah. back, right? Well, it was about a concept the then. Yeah. Yeah. And then... Who have they tested this on now? Well, some people have it. Yeah. Oh, like... I wait, think the, I think like it's in... Did they choose... Wait, you can Canada, choose it? right? Or huh? something? You can choose it? Or? No, no, I think like it's a beta type It's a thing. random like... like oh, it, they want to do it eventually. Like I saw somebody's wrong. message that They're said like, oh, you've it. been selected to like hide the likes or something. And they give a message like, it shouldn't matter how many uh, likes you get. It should matter how what the content you post is. Like Instagram is saying hmm. this, I thought it was pretty cool. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Interesting. It might it might affect like businesses and brands and social influencers, but I mean, sponsored honestly, posts still show good. up. All I say is good. Well, they, I think they can still like it, right? They can still and, like it, and yeah. so and I think you can still see it. The maybe. algorithms will still be the same. Mm-hmm. It's just you can't see the likes. And yeah, that like thing. And maybe that's a kid's like. Yeah. In in their head, like that's what is so important, but. It because we're cause older, a lot we know less the algorithms fights. and stuff. You also, know. also, we see this like on YouTube a lot. Like when a video has like a lot of more views, it's perceived as more prestigious video right. or sure. a better video yeah. when it's not the case. Yeah. And I think this sure. is what they're trying to get at. Like your content, mm. it will show for itself. It'll definitely yeah. make people stop fighting as much because I know girls be getting mad at their men who have like, "Why she like your picture?" and like, "No, no, 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 yeah, like that type of thing." So it's so. promoting cheating. And, oh, it's, oh my <laughs> the I, I have to. I'm the girl on the podcast. I have to speak for the woman. On the show. That's very like us. Uh, stereotypical like towards <laughs> girls like oh girls so, talk so about go- like what if i want to talk about gossip no i mean hey listen what so if i'm that girl she's in like, guys can get no away with it back. now yeah. no <laughs> but like um me. <laughs> i'd be i'd be really excited about that because i do care a lot about content and like um there's a lot of people that like there's this app i have that like um it shows you how many followers are real and how many are fake or whatever right so it mm. says like oh like 90 percent of your followers are real or something so then when i see sometimes people that are like following um that like have a huge mm-hmm. following count but then they only have like 200 you know, like, likes on a picture and yeah, they have like less. 30 000 followers exactly then i'm like wait what the heck yeah. and <laughs> and I, i'm only looking because i'm like okay do should i know who this person is for yeah. some reason but you're like you, you care too much about your followers and like now i'm not even interested in like whatever right. you might be posting possibly because mm-hmm. you care more about that yeah it so, puts a bad taste i'm like for if sure, i see somebody sure. who bought their followers or liked it I, i'm I automatically crossing 20 30 percent real followers i'm like what? jeez bro like you gotta chill with that <laughs> you gotta share that app with me i'll send it to you <laughs> we actually use it on you <laughs> 30 like, we mine were real. pretty good <laughs> yeah i think so uh, yeah. yeah yeah i don't know no it was remember no. Yes, I no, I don't think so. Anyways, <laughs> um, 
<laughs> so on to our guest today because Sorry. this is our uh, Ramadan is going on. We wanted to highlight a topic that often gets discussed, but nobody really knows, you know, the facts or or, or any ex- people that are experienced from this place, and that is Palestine. Um, our stranger today is Haytham Qureshi. Um, he's going to tell us a little bit about his experiences from Palestine, um, just from his perspective, what he ho- kind of hopes and gets from uh, the future and, and why he loves his land and, and his people. So uh, we hope you stay tuned in for the whole episode. It's very, it's very beautiful the way that he describes everything. So mm-hmm. without further ado, here is Haytham. I mean, like, during work, it was, it was tough, but yesterday, I think, like, I got I got a little more used to it yesterday, and uh, when I, after I went to Friday prayer, like, I felt a little happier and more, like, calm. I like how you pointed to your stomach, yeah. a little happier. <laughs> a little happier. Are you super nice tired hungry. and hungry throughout yeah, the day? Yeah, y- usually, yeah, and I feel like I'm, I'm starting, because this is my first Ramadan working full-time, I'm having this... Uh, what time do you get off? So right now I'm doing different. I'm doing Ramadan hours. So I'm doing 5 a.m. to 1 p.m. I feel like that's so much harder to do morning times. Uh, yeah. Like I would rather be like exerting all my energy right before my fast opens mm-hmm. because then by that time you run your energy, you can eat. Right. How was uh, your experience as a rapper for first time? You <laughs> made that video with Shami. Mm-hmm. Yo, that was really that was really fun. You looked terrified at the beginning. Yeah, I, like, are we actually doing this? Because <laughs> uh, I, I was thinking to myself, like, okay, I, I already know like what it goes in, like what goes into it, kind of. Like, I know, yeah. Ooh, yeah. I, I know, like the, how difficult it is, and like how much work is put into it. Because uh-huh. you know, I watch interviews, I, I talk to him, I I try to like just pick his brain. And I'm like, wait, so now I'm going to be a part of this? Yeah. <laughs> like, oh, no. You killed it, though. You did a good job. Yeah, thank mm-hmm. you. He wrote and everything It was himself. really fun, though. And you uh, you threw a cultural twist in there? Did I did, yeah, man. Like, I, I had to talk about marriage. Like, that, that was a topic that was on my head just because, you know, with, uh, I, I don't know about, like, other, like, Eastern cultures, but at least, like, in the Arab world, like, when you make an accomplishment, like, graduating, yeah. The next thing is they say, uh, oh, like, so when are you when getting, are you getting married? married? And then they'll, they'll say a phrase called, uh, like, when they see other people get married, they say a phrase called Aqbalak in, uh, in Arabic, which means, you know, hopefully your chances are like that. Hopefully your luck is similar to that. <laughs> Shamir, Aqbalak. <laughs> Aqbalak. I don't know why I did that in Italian. <laughs> Aqbalak. <laughs> yeah, dude. It's he tried to fit that in the song. I was like, how are you going to rhyme Aqbalak? <laughs> like that's gonna be hard. Yeah, I mean, you can make it. Ha- you can make anything rhyme, <laughs> dude. I had to look up uh, English names and Arabic names that sound like that are spelled somewhat similarly. Yeah. So I, I came up with a what is it Sally and Selwa. Yeah, that's the that's the closest thing I could come up with. I was thinking, oh, what if I use like Emily? What? A- Emily. No, whenever we're making songs, it's like you have to think about like multiple pronunciations of a word right. to get like what you want. But usually it ends up being funnier um, uh, okay. when you do it like in the accent, in the wrong accent mm-hmm. and rhyme it with an English word. Right. So it's funny. Um, so you're from the Gaithersburg area. Yeah. Um, is that around where you work too? You work in Baltimore? So I do work in Baltimore. Yeah. yeah. And I commute from Rockville. Mm. And you're of Palestinian descent. Yes, sir. Um, are there a lot of Palestinians around where you live? Uh, not at all. Uh, in Virginia, yeah. Uh huh. Um, but in Maryland, not so much. Yeah. Um, how are you usually perceived amongst like uh, the Muslim community and amongst non-Muslim community? So, I mean, among the Muslim community, a lot of them seem to really like like Palestinians or or support Palestine. So it's not it's not as difficult. Like you know, around Pakistani people, they they seem to they seem to like Palestinians. Uh, other Arabs uh, will say, "Yo, oh, that's that's awesome! Yeah, like we're rooting for you and all this <laughs> stuff." I don't know yeah. how much of that's true, but yeah, you know, it, it feels it feels it feels nice to see like there's some support. But then for the non-Muslim community, um, a lot of the, some of them might not know where Palestine is, or mm-hmm. they'll just hear bad things about it. Um, and some of them will be like, "Oh, where is that on the map?" Yeah, uh, is it is it Palestine or Palestine? Do they say both? Uh, both. So Palestine is the Arabic word for Palestine. Okay. Uh, and then, well, if you're speaking English and saying Palestine, it'd be Palestine. Like, it was, Palestine, that's why right. I said it like that. Yeah, I know a lot of Pakistani people say Palestine. Yeah, Palestine. Like, they say it in. Uh, I, I like saying Palestine. It's just like it's swift, it's soft. 
Yeah. Um, Sounds cool. Yeah. Anything to sound cool, you know. <laughs> for, for sure. <laughs> no. Um. So let's kind of get into it. Like, uh, you know, we invite you here. Uh, it's the month of Ramadan. I feel like this is a topic that a lot of people are don't know enough about. Right. Um. And and you feel like you have um enough experience and and you're passionate about it and i think yeah. you do like we were having a conversation before this you do like know a lot about history geography and all that like you're actually very passionate about yeah. it so let's start with were you born there um or did you live there yeah did you come so over? actually before i start anything um sure. i want to say like so some of the stuff i'll say mm -hmm. it might come off as biased to some people but this bias comes from my ex personal experience. Like I, I felt all of these emotions as a kid and I seen mm -hmm. it and I seen what it's done to people and the effect of it, not just on Palestinians, but on other like surrounding people or, you know, surrounding religions as well. Yeah. And that's so, great. And I just yeah. want to say also, like, I think our listeners who have been listening for some time know that we've actually had an Israeli on our podcast as well, right. as well as this Palestinian girl. And what we did was uh, we allowed them to share whatever they wanted in their experience. Yes. Um, and obviously we wanted to ask them things like, you know, what do you think about the other side when it applied? But it was, but our podcast is more so to let you share what you want. Um, yeah. As far as your experiences and stuff and let people know what it's like to be from there. Yeah. So whatever exactly. you'd like to share, you know, we can definitely do that. All right. Um, and it doesn't have to be like sure. a political thing whatsoever. I think right. this is like the beauty of where you're from and your story. Right. It's, it's and a personal story. Yeah, so. I'll give you my, my experience. I mean, my experience will have, like, politics in it. Of course. That's the sure. thing. Not because Because for kids over there, politics is everything, right. believe it or not. Like, yeah. five-year-old kids follow politics over yeah. there. Interesting. It's kind of scary. Yeah. That's cool. So, um, okay, so what when were you over there and like when did you come over okay so i was born in rockville maryland like a lot of people in montgomery county okay um and when i was six well growing up until then i had like the normal american life just you know a nice house just chilling with your friends you know riding bikes playing with toys uh tv shows like uh, the typical typical stuff american would have and you appear caucasian so you probably blended in fine. uh yeah yeah exactly and i had like a lot of friends from different like groups uh like yeah and that, that's what i liked about growing up in montgomery county and how diverse it was okay it was that i got that experience Mm. But I didn't think too much about it. It was just because, like, hey, these are my friends. Mm. Um, and then at some point when I was six, my mom mentioned we would, like, be going to Palestine, mm. uh, to Palestine for some time. Were you worried or did you know anything about it? So it was weird because up to that point, we had visited Palestine a few times, like, in the late 90s. And I remember we used to go to the beach a lot, like, Mediterranean. Uh, the Dead Sea and, like, all this other stuff. So I thought it was just, like, another time where I'm just visiting my grandma and you know we're, we're just gonna and have were those times chill like what yeah in the late 90s um i mean i can't say anything in palestine's history is ever like chill okay like it's not it's it's never been an easy history mm -hmm. but in that point it was a different different world than what it became a few years after mm -hmm. so back in the back in the 90s when we would go visit yeah we would just go we would go have a good time like yeah have fun with the relatives maybe go to the beach see some sights you know, we had a bunch of picture albums with us seeing like the historic sites in Bethlehem and Jerusalem, uh, Dead Sea, and all, and all of that. And is um, there a lot of family you have over there? Right. Yeah. I, a lot of um, a lot of them in Palestine, in the West Bank, mm -hmm. and uh, Jordan, and um, uh, in parts of Europe and America. Okay. Yeah. So, so at that point, I thought it was just another vacation. Mm -hmm. Like, hey, I'm I'm fi I finished first grade in America, and I'll be back for second grade, uh, and so. It, it, we, we went and it was like a really different thing. It was different than the other times we landed in. So we would land in Tel Aviv airport, which is in um, like the Israeli area mm. um, or what they call it, Israel. Um, we, we see that as the occupied territories. So for this one, I'll just refer to the predominantly uh, Israeli area as Israel. And then with predominantly Palestinian areas in the West Bank and Gaza, I'll say Palestine, just okay. to make the and discretion. Do you regularly not identify Israel as its own nation? Um, I mean, it's it's a little tough to answer because even overseas, we'll say, um, so as in like, we're going to Israel. Mm. Um, and we know what they mean. Like, we know what they mean by that. Or, mm. so as in, oh, this car came from Israel. Mm. Like, so when we when we hear that, we know what they mean. Mm. But 
in other st stances, we when we, a lot of times when we say Palestine, we kind of refer to the entire like triangle, entire dagger, um, as I call it, not just the West Bank and Gaza, because historically we, we have lived in, you know, these other regions and many of us had to move out. Mm. Um, so we get we get there, we land in Tel Aviv airport. And then we were going, we we're driving to the West Bank, and all of a sudden we're on this like really rubble road. It's just like, a, like really like sh the car is shaking. Mm. I'm like, what is this? Like, why are we not on like a, like a paved road? This is so weird. And like, I didn't know, but basically at the time there was a lot of like struggle and strife. This is 2002 at the time. So this is during a time called the Second Intifada. Intifada in Arabic means uprising. So this is just like a huge period of struggle for, uh, and it's changed a lot of like people's lives and um, like Israelis and Palestinians. And I'll probably be talking about the Palestinian perspective right now. So there was like a lot of roads that we weren't like, really allowed to go on. Um, so we had to take this really this, this back road that it's just it's not paved. It's just rubble it's shaking. I'm like, where, where are we going? So we end up getting to my, uh, to like where my family's from. It's this village called the Neb. It's in a, it's in a city called Tulkarim, which is on the edge of the West Bank, close to the Mediterranean. So it's like really humid there and everything. What is the West Bank area, by the way? So the West Bank area is the Palestinian area that is, um, well, these, the, there are these borders where predominantly Palestinians live to the west of the Jordan River. That's what they call it, the West Bank. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's where they started the settlements, is that correct? That's where a lot of settlements are, um, which are which are found illegal by the United Nations. I'm not making it up, like you can look it up anywhere. It is found illegal by the United Nations. Mm. I don't know too much uh, of the rules behind like how you can enforce it or what's the backlash of, you know, saying something's illegal. Yeah. Or but, who's, up, who's to step in or whatever. Yeah, but it's... So your family's there? Yeah. So my, my family, um, yeah, they, so they live in, like, a Palestinian, Palestinian Authority-controlled area today. Because Palestine does technically have a government. It's not very strong, but they do have a government. We have passports. I have a Palestinian passport. We, uh, yeah, we have our own president and all this other stuff. But it's, it's kind of like a puppet government in a way it's our, our president's almost like someone you you uh he's not like a bad leader but you start to like feel feel bad for him because it's like dude there's nothing you can do and mm. you know there's nothing you can do mm. um about your situation like he's just in the absolutely worst situation so it's it's like no no other leader we're gonna get is gonna help yeah at this point um so, so what was that experience you know going from you were six at the time you said i was six at the time yeah. and i was about to turn seven in like a couple of weeks yeah and what did you uh, see happening kind of over time? So w when I really knew things were different, it's going to sound like a little funny, but I turned my seventh birthday uh, was like a week or two into our, our first time there. I thought, oh, hey, it's my birthday. I'm going to get some nice presents. Mm. And I actually didn't get anything. I got <laughs> my, my cousin was trying to be thoughtful and they gave me like, I guess, like some stickers. Mm. Like they were trying to be thoughtful, and uh, I mean, I didn't, I didn't appreciate it back then because I was so used to like you know getting like Legos or airplanes, just like the rest of us did. Uh, if you grew up here, yeah. uh, but no, it was, it was just like they couldn't really get much for us. Like so, they didn't have access to it, or uh, it, it was like they didn't have access, but they also didn't really have the money for it as well. So I knew I was like in a different, different world. I didn't really know Arabic yet. Um, I learned it not too long after. But, like I always knew like what my parents were saying, and I knew a few phrases, but I never knew how to like put sentences together. Hmm. And then um, because I watched English cartoons, I remember my American cartoons from back when I lived in America, Cartoon Network, Nickelodeon, Disney. Uh, I remembered like some of the lines from those shows, and then those shows actually appeared uh, in in Palestine and like the Arab world on these Arabic channels. So I remembered what they said in English, and then when I would hear it in Arabic, I was like, oh, so that's yeah. what it is. And it's how it's I kind learn. of funny hearing that. Yeah, I know when we go to Pakistan, we see like SpongeBob. It's like funny, and he's like Patrick the Mecca. Like, right. what are you doing? It's so funny. <laughs> yeah, uh, SpongeBob in Arabic is the most annoying, cringeworthy <laughs> thing. Um, but yeah, that's how I learned it. And also, uh, basically, my Arabic is like we call it Falahi. Falahi is like country. 
like as in like this is rural like you, so basically you're like an arab redneck okay this is basically what it is so i have like a country accent in arabic hmm. and some of my other like arabic friends will like laugh at me like oh you have a fadlahi dialect or accent <laughs> It's so funny. Yeah. Is that because you're from like the village? Area? Yeah, I'm from okay. the village area. But if you go into the city, they talk a little differently. Um, they're, I guess, they're much more like calm in the, how they talk. Uh, they'll have more si silent letters than some of the more aggressive, like sounding letters. Mm -hmm. So when you when you started seeing that transition, so you, you, your birthday happened and everything. Um, what did you start to think about? You know what Palestine is, or who's occupying it and what was kind of what were you hearing around you well so when you grow up palestinian no matter where you are whether you've been to palestine or not um even if you're so far from it you are born into this like pride uh, of it like i think palestinians are some of the most proud people yeah and sure. like ever i don't think i've seen that many people that proud of where they're from I mean, even have to be too yeah right? yeah like you have to be because you know that's that's your identity and it's it's a land that's you know being you're slowly losing it and you know you've seen your family lose it you've seen other families lose it i know people whose families are not allowed to return mm -hmm. like they their families haven't been back since the 40s or 60s um and they would just dream to go back and a lot of these people these people like they'll be from like dubai or kuwait or you know europe and they'll be like in you know these are better areas better jobs, more money. But, you know, to be honest, the people that are still in like the West Bank, the Palestinians still in the West Bank and Gaza and even in the occupied areas of Israel, we kind of see them as the lucky ones because they didn't leave. Like they, they, they stuck around. So they, they're sacrificing a lot of this amazing, uh, amazing stuff that they could have had in these other countries because they don't want to lose their identity or their, their homeland because that's kind of like what what they want you to do mm. Mm -hmm. how do you feel about palestinians that aren't uh proud i guess or or kind of scared of where they come from i think there's a comedian uh mo amir mo yeah he doesn't really say that he's from palestine he says from, he's from qatar a lot a kuwait. A kuwait. A kuwait. Sorry. yeah so Sorry. Actually, there's there's a reason behind that. Okay. So many Palestinians, including my dad at one point, mm -hmm. did end up go go to Kuwait. So at the time, I mean, you know, going to college in in Palestine or you know getting a job, it it wasn't always like the most stable or the best decision. You know, it was more lucrative to go to America, Canada, Europe, and the Middle East. That like those countries were, they were making that oil money. Like mm -hmm. the jobs were popping up. So people were moving to Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, Iraq. They're moving to all these places um, for better opportunity and better jobs. So many Palestinians who like willingly left or had to leave or or were just afraid, a lot of them did end up going to Kuwait because Kuwait's where the where the money was. That's where the jobs were. And so many Palestinians, uh, a lot of my family were either born in Palestine or born in Kuwait, mm. actually. So many of them ended up in Kuwait and many of them ended up leaving after the Gulf War in the 90s, which is how Mo'amir left. Mm -hmm. um, that's the time he left. Yeah. Um, what do you feel about the people who um, basically Israel has offered some to some extent Muslims can have an Israeli passport, right? Yeah. From, so h how do you feel about um, the people who do go ahead and take that opportunity and then are able to, you know, travel more freely and have more opportunities with that versus people because they are i guess essentially losing some of their identity by yeah. submitting to that but what's your personal opinion on so, it so yeah, i can tell you about these documents man like uh palestinians have so many documents that it's actually insane the you don't just show a passport you show a bunch of permits show a bunch of stamps you have to have your pictures from different areas. To do what? To travel? To just get, even get into Palestine okay. or like, even like leave it. Mm. it. It's really tough. And you have so, to carry that around you and stuff? Um, a lot of times, yeah, you, you would. And there's different rules based on different people. So Palestinians who live in the occupied areas of Israel are technically Israeli citizens. But as much as, let's say, Israel will say they're a democracy and that, you know, they give democracy and freedom to their non-Jewish citizens... It's not always like that socially. Like on paper, they might have the rights of an Israeli citizen, 
but in person and so and in the social context they they really don't have as much they're still seen as like second class citizens so there's something i'll tell you now a lot of the people that lived in the that still live in the occupied territories who never wanted to leave their home their areas are slowly being like orientalized or gentrified and what it is is many palestinians who live in let's say there's a city called yaffa or jaffa in english um and it's pretty close to tel aviv it's like right across like one side of the mediterranean and the other is tel aviv the other is old jaffa or yaffa i'm gonna call it yaffa so that area still has a fair amount of arabs like still living there but if you see their homes their homes are so like decrepit and t worn down and it's as if no one has performed maintenance on them in, in forever. So the thing is, if let's say Israel has these rule, like housing rules against Palestinians, um, and you can look this up too. And this is from experience again, and this is from people I know that have lived in parts of Jerusalem, which is also considered an occupied area and other parts. And I've seen their houses and you know what they had to go through and some of the charges they had to face. So basically, if you, let's say, have a really old home, a very historic home that's, you know, been maybe 100, 200 years old, maybe even older. Some of these communities are like they're really, really old and they're documented. You can find a lot of them in the old libraries. Um, so you can uh, you can see, like, let's say I'm, I'm going to have an extra kid, but I don't have much space in my house. You know, people are very hands-on and they want to build another room. Like, you know how they are. Like, people are productive. They like to do stuff like that. Israel won't let you build that other room. Mm -hmm. Bec you, you basically cannot renovate your house or perform, like, a lot of, like, a really, like, the basic maintenance you, re you really need. This is kind of a way to get your house to deteriorate even further thus forcing you to want to leave that house and move to a predominantly Palestinian area, like in the West Bank. Okay. And then when that happens, they would either tear down that house and, and then redo it, renovate it, and then move an Israeli family in. Mm. And has this happened to uh, anyone you know, family, friends? Um, um, not too many people that I personally know because my family's from the West Bank itself. Right. But uh, family, friends, yes. Mm -hmm. um, you know, my, my sister's husband studied, uh, my sister's husband is an Egyptian man, and he, uh, he studied with a man uh, like from Jerusalem, a uh, Palestinian man from Jerusalem. And we went to his, we visited his house and he was telling us that, you know, he was trying to build like a tiny little garage for his car. And he was building out of wood, like just wood, plain wood, and he had enough space to put his car there. And he, because he just wanted shade for his car. And he was telling, telling us that uh, Israel wants him to tear down that, that garage right away. And if you see his house, his house is like, the kitchen is so tiny and it's just in the middle of this living room. Mm -hmm. And they have a little daughter and there's not really much space to put her. But the thing is, like these people are so, these people are so like strong and resilient in the sense that you, you give them these obstacles, they want to stay, they don't care. How now, does Israel enforce these rules? Um, that I can't, I can't quite answer it that way, but there are definitely zoning laws that you can, you can do the research about and mm -hmm. see for yourself. Um, as the history, as we kind of know it, that, um, is out there, I guess, is that, um, you know, there was, there was this land that like Muslims and, and Jews and, uh, Christians lived yes. amongst peacefully they did. and predominantly Muslims. Right. Um, and then around the 1800s, there was, uh, a lot of Jewish people kind of scattering around. So, uh, beginning 1900s, okay, yeah, but late 1800s, um, the Holocaust definitely, uh, right, it was big. Yeah. Helped in, in, uh, spreading, uh, Jewish people around. And then I believe the UN, um, actually made so the UN's first policy was uh, how to divide this land mm. that was their that was when the UN was created their first plan of action was how to fix this yeah how do they cut this up um, so now at the time yeah like so people like to say Palestine never existed the word Palestine never existed and all of that now me I love geography I love history and I read these books and I see these maps before 1948, they called the land the British Mandate of Palestine. Mm. 
Before the British, they called it Ottoman Palestine. And also, Palestine was involved in like these global sports, like world, the World Cup and Olympics. I'm not sure one or the other, but you can find the games and competitions right. from the 20s and 1910s or, or whatever. Printed money. And it says it. Palestine versus whichever country they're playing. This is before Israel was created. They called it Palestine. Mm. The Romans, the Palestinian, Palestine is what came from the Romans. The Romans named it Palestine. That's where it came from. What else would it have been called, um, like before right before, Israel. right before Israel? At the time, yes, it was called Judea, and there was a historic Jewish population there. Unfortunately, many diasporas happened over history, and many different empires and all of that came in. And then, you know, with uh, I guess the rise of Islam in like, you know, maybe the six hundreds, a um, thousands. Uh, the Arabic language came through and it spread and then you had more Christians and Muslims um, so like the Arabs of Palestine are Christian and Muslim mm -hmm. uh, more so Muslim now uh, many of many of them uh, many of the Christian ones are actually in America um, okay yeah so you have you you had you had that and the thing is like while that land was mostly Muslim Jerusalem was split pretty evenly it was a third Muslim, a third Christian, a third Jewish. And it, it was like that. And there would be old stories of, uh, let's say, an, like an Eastern Orthodox man. He, uh, he knew the Quran, and he would celebrate Yom Kippur and, and uh, Hanukkah, and he lived peacefully among his neighbors. Mm. And that could have been the perfect model. Yeah. So, you know, with in Europe, there was a huge rise in nationalism in like the 1880s, 1890s. Um, happened like Austria, Hungary, uh, happened in Germany, happened in a lot of these places. And the Jewish people, many of them were uh, ostracized and chastised and they faced a lot of hardships. So this uh, nationalistic idea also came about called Zionism. Um, and it was to return to the land of their ancestors, which was Palestine. Mm -hmm. Now, th this is where I, I need to distinguish this for those that don't know. When people criticize Israel and then you call them anti-Semitist, that doesn't make sense because the thing is, anti-Semitism is very wrong. That means you hate the Jewish religion, you hate the Jewish people. Anti-Zionist is different. Zionism is a political party. We don't like the Israeli government. While, yes, there are, I can't make an excuse for people. Yes, there are many people that do, that are very anti-Semitist. Yes, from everywhere, including Arabs. Yes, that is true. There are many. But there is also a lot of hate towards the other way at the same time. And I'm not going to take away the pain that you know, many of these people have felt. Uh, I'm not going to take that away. Like, rightfully so, yeah, they, they needed a homeland. Because like, there's no way they were facing good treatment in Germany and Russia and Ukraine and all of these other places. Now, with this influx of people coming in, Many, uh, many farm Palestinian farmers or Arab farmers were kind of uh, like slowly losing their their areas, and this is a product of colonialism with the British in the sense that they they promised a lot of things to different people, and they messed a lot of things up. So you're telling me people who weren't even living there or had anything to do with it divided up. This land, yeah. So which they um, had nothing to do with. Yeah. So the British. Uh, so around the time where this was, there was this equality in Jerusalem. This was like around World War One. Mm -hmm. Now, when the British came, they made a lot of promises to many people, and they did this. They did this everywhere. They did this in Africa. They did. They did this in India. They did this in the Middle East. They did this everywhere. You know, like you guys, I'm sure are familiar with your histories yeah. as well. Um, in terms of the British. Mm. Um. So. What happened is like they they said that they would promise these Arabs like their their freedom and independence just like the other Arab nations, but then with the influx of Jewish people, they also promised a Jewish homeland, in in Palestine, mm -hmm. and that created a, a little problem is because you promised some things to two different people, and then you had an influx of people fleeing the, their the struggle, and you promised them this land. Now with the UN partition plan. They gave around 53% of the land to the incoming Jewish population. 
Meanwhile, the rest of the Arabs got less than that. And if you know, if you ever look up the map, it's a really jumbled up puzzle piece. Mm. It's actually disgusting how like not even they split it and how weird they yeah. put the areas. It's like different spots, right? It's like just just blotches, yeah. like yeah, random right. blotches of areas. Instead of like, oh, maybe you get the right half, I get the left half, or a top mm. and bottom. And I think if you were to look this up, I think a lot of people, we might even have a bias uh, being Muslim and stuff right. like that. I think a lot of people, if they do their research and stuff, they'll actually be able to find all of this, what you're talking about. But right. uh, in America, actually, especially when it comes to... Uh, running for a political position a lot of kind of the check marks to even run mm -hmm. uh, seems to be like support for israel like mm -hmm. people cannot advance almost yeah, like unless they say that yeah. actually there's a atlantic article and there's there's many of them but this one specifically says that americans pay about 10 million dollars every day in taxes to israel which equals out to 38 billion dollars over the course of a decade right um and, and that's a military assistance deal that america has with israel so exactly. obviously we have in our news like many other issues, um, a, a one-sided thing and, and kind of like what you described of yeah. like wiping out the recognition of existence of almost of Palestine yes. in general. That happens especially in Jerusalem. It happens a lot. And, yeah. You know. So what do you think is something that people often misperceive about Palestine, especially in America? So they, they do see us as aggressors and like, okay, yeah, we, we are flawed. I get that. But what you have to understand is this concept of hate, and they'll say oh, Palestinians are very anti-Semitic and all of this other stuff. Now, the thing is, there's hate works in different ways. Now, if you have hate in a place of power, it's different than when you have hate when you're down under. Mm. So we don't have a military. We can't defend ourselves. So while there are like these groups that are called radical and all that, and I, you know, I don't quite support, you know, radicalization or terrorism or any of that what you have to understand is the theory of why like these people do these these things that appear as dangerous and bad and you're destroying communities it's that when do we get to defend ourselves mm -hmm. like everyone always says like israel is you know this is a self-defense this is self-defense self-defense Oh, the Palestinians again, did less. this first. That's why this many yeah. people died. They but, shouldn't have done that. You that know, seems to be a e narrative block. Even when Palestinians do it first, you, you realize, like, we still have no power. We don't have an army. Mm -hmm. We want to defend ourselves. People want to defend themselves. Although, like, some of the mentalities might be wrong in the sense that some might say, oh, we should exterminate this people. We should exterminate that people. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't believe in extermination of any people. That's genocide. No, I don't believe in that. But... The concept of hate and understanding that people who just don't have much anymore, they're, they're tired. They, they will go to sick endeavors or they'll go to these dangerous endeavors to, to fight for what they have, for what, they, the, what little they have. You, the population that you are chastising and putting at second class they're going to start developing these really awful, awful, like, mentalities. Right. Like, I don't support, like, these, these bad mentalities that are, like, anti-Jewish or, or whatever. But you got to understand, this was created I at know. some point. This was created at some point. Many, many Arab nations had Jewish people. And after the creation of Israel, yes, many Arabs were very angry. And because they did side with Palestine and they saw, hey, like... You know, these people are maybe destroying or the livelihood of someone else. Mm -hmm. Palestinians had some of the highest rate of refugees in the world. Mm -hmm. You can't make that up. If you follow these Palestine pages, you'll see old footage from the 40s and 60s of people fleeing on sailboats, like jumping borders. You'll hear about these mass. No, you actually you won't hear about these massacres. You won't on any news channel. I know about these massacres. I was like, I, my parents ingrained it in my head to know this. You know, we don't forget this stuff, but the world has forgotten us. Yeah. And so the thing is, many people will say, oh, why don't you just go to, you have a bunch of Arab neighbors around you. Why don't you just move to those Arab countries? I'm not from Kuwait. I'm not from Jordan. I'm not from Lebanon. I'm not from Egypt. Would you put a Mexican person in El Salvador? Like, would you be, oh, but they, they're Spanish speaking countries. Why would you want to leave your own home if you grew up there? 
and your livelihood was there. I think the difference is that they gave them a place of common worship and right. then are expecting you to now go to a place of common worship whereas you were there for culture and land. Like, like you feel, you know, right to that land. But, um, keep uh, I was going to ask, like, you're speaking about those other surrounding countries. You know, America is obviously assisting Israel in more than plentiful ways. Uh, mm-hmm. What about places like Saudi Arabia and, and Dubai and, like, people that have a lot of money they support yeah. Israel too right. so so wh- how do you guys feel about how do you justify that I mean being Muslim neighboring countries I, I, I have no I don't know I don't really have any words mm-hmm. I just I, I don't know how to feel really it just feels like we're nowhere mm-hmm. and it's not gonna get any better mm-hmm. anytime soon like you know yeah in a perfect world you know, we could say, yeah, we should have a two-state solution. And, you know, maybe, I don't know how realistic it is. And I, I would like us all to live in peace. But to have a two-state, there's way more factors. Mm-hmm. What are you going to do about the Israeli settlements in the West Bank now? Are you going to take them out? Are you going to move them out? What about Jerusalem? Are you going to have a united? Are you going to have a split? Whose capital is it going to be? Yeah. And if you do split them both, which side gets which? There's a lot of Jewish people who do speak out about the treatment of Palestinians. And, you know, they say, you know, as Jewish people, like our beliefs do not support, you know, the treatment. Because they're not Zionists. Right. Even even in Israel, there's there's a lot of people who don't support it. And even Bernie Sanders was vocal about the fact that he wouldn't take part in um, Jewish uh, conventions and things like that because he didn't want to be in support of it because he is essentially for the people. Yes. How did you guys feel about Bernie Sanders and him being vocal in that way while still being a Jewish person and using his platform in that way? I, I think he reveals... So I say this, and a lot of us say this. Saudi Arabia is not really a good representation of Muslim people, mm-hmm. but Israel, Israel is not a good representation of the Jewish people. Oh, that's good. Hmm. Israel is not a good representation of the Jewish people because... They are putting this. They are putting the Zionist ideals um, with Judaism. Zionists Zionism was founded by secular Jewish people, so people that weren't even religious. Like yes, um, I, I understand like the need for a homeland, and it, it in a perfect perfect world it could have been like that because Jerusalem, as we said, was split pretty equally back then, and we all lived in harmony. But again, with colonialism. Um, like the British drawing these borders, you created these borders and, you know, the Jewish people were looking for a home. And so they were fine with the the borders that the UN partitioned. But the Arabs that lived there were like, wait, what? So of course we were going to be angry. Of course these wars were going to break out. Of course. Like, why wouldn't you defend what you love? Why wouldn't you? But with how the media is, the Arabs are always the aggressors. The Muslims are always the aggressors. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's just, it's honestly whoever has the most money to push their political... That's what it is. You yeah, know, it's money. It's, yeah. it's, uh, you guys aren't going to have a strong um, military. You're not going to be able to have a stronger platform for, yeah. you know. And I think that's cool that AJ Plus um, yeah. was able to kind of begin to put that out there. But ultimately, with the resources that it seems like Israel's taking away from Palestine, Mm -hmm. they're basically just waiting till everybody assimilates. Because, I I mean, I'm posing the question to you, what would be the long-term, I guess, solution or um, place that the people who are living in Palestine, like, what is their future to be at this point when they cannot, you know, redo their houses? It's basically they need to assimilate and go into Israel and kind of you know, yeah. submit to them. Just to clarify, so with the uh, redoing houses, th- those are the laws on Arab citizens within Israel itself. So if you're in a Palestinian Authority governed area, you should be fine. Like that's Palestinian mm-hmm. government. So my family is from where a Palestinian government would, would rule. But in terms of where is um, Israel, the, like what we consider the occupied areas, those those Arabs that are Israeli citizens, they're not quite seen as as the same as actual Israeli Jews. Now, Israel will say they're the only democracy in the Middle East. How can you call yourself a democracy when you're putting, when you're creating these apartheid? Now, the thing is, like, there's, on the highways in the West Bank, if you can even call them highways, there's certain roads that only Palestinians can go to, certain documents only we can go to. If you have a Palestinian citizenship, you can't go into the occupied areas uh, of Israel, and including Jerusalem. 
So Jerusalem has the third holiest site in Islam and one of the holiest sites in Christianity, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. And yes, there are many, many Arab Christians and they're basically our brothers because we, we, we struggled the same. We grew up together. We, we're from, we share the same you know, religious figures. We see them often standing in line to protect people while yeah. they're praying. Yeah, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, which is where Jesus was believed to be revived, um, the, the family that owns the key to that church is a Muslim family. Mm. And this is in the Christian quarter by the Via Della Rosa where they believe Jesus carried the cross on his back and was tortured. So there is a, a common bond as Palestinians. We, we're, we're, we don't care. We don't distinguish between that. Like the, 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 we bond through the struggle. Yeah. Regardless. Exactly what, is, what is an uh, Arab Christian's um, role almost in Palestine at this point? Like wh where do they lie in all of this? So there, there's not as many, um, not as many today. Um, I don't know the, the exact percentages. But again, it's it's the same same feeling. It's the same feeling because you know they that's that's theirs, and you know people like to associate Arab with Muslim, but a lot of Arabs are Christian too. I mean, Christianity began in the Middle East, just like a lot of these monotheistic religions. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so the Israeli gentleman that we had on the podcast, um, I felt a lot of what he was saying was kind of like, uh, you know, what are we supposed to do now? That's my home now as well, and it kind of reminds me. Of this comparison I hear often of the Palestinian people being kind of like Native Americans where mm -hmm. their land was completely wiped out and people in America now feel like well what am I supposed to do like I was born and raised here my my parents were like where am I supposed to go so do you do you see any side of like that argument with um, Israeli I mean especially children growing up there and stuff so I don't I, I don't really know what the future is gonna look like mm -hmm. I honestly think it's pretty bleak. Um, I think it's I think it's really bleak. <laughs> I actually don't know. A lot of Palestinians might not not like me saying this, but I don't think there's that much hope, to be honest. But that's all we can do is like stay strong. There's a motto we have. It's called resist to exist, and that's mm. that's something that we we are all like born knowing. Resist to exist. And, you know, we want to protect our livelihood. And, you know, when I mentioned this whole thing about, you know, if you have Palestinian citizenship, you can't enter Jerusalem or the occupied Israeli areas unless you have like a, a special permit, you could. And, you know, last summer when I actually got to visit, you know, like I, I always wished I could go back to Jerusalem and, you know, maybe even see some of these areas that my dad would always tell me about. And luckily, um, we were able to get a permit for a day. It would be. It would last it from 5 a.m. to 7 p.m., and I took advantage of that. Jeez. Getting getting that permit, getting that permit was like, I felt happier to get that permit than my own college acceptance. Wow! Like I was so happy to hear I can go to Jerusalem. Like I, I was just jumping for joy, mm -hmm. um, and you know, my mom. Let's say uh, she did surgery on both knees, but she was really happy and she was willing to walk everywhere. I took her to I, I took her to quarters of Jerusalem that she never thought she would be at. Um, like, were you guys like worried or scared while you guys were there? Or at this point, at this point, we've seen it all. There's no point in being afraid anymore. Like there's there's just no point. Like you, your only choice is to stay strong. Mm. Uh, you have to keep going. Um, and like for example, the rest of my family we have Palestinian citizenship, citizenship except my dad. Now my dad, he. Uh, so he was born and raised there, and then at some point when he was when he was working in other countries, uh, I guess he forgot to renew his citizenship, and he lost it. So the thing is, like, for a Palestinian citizen to get into Palestine to get into the West Bank, we usually go through Jordan. So we'll land in Amman, uh, and then we'll go through this crazy border security through Jordan, Israel, and Palestinians. We we'll go th with all the with all the documents that we have with all the stack, you know. Maybe one day I could show you what the stack looks like. Mm -hmm. um, it's very degrading, very very degrading process. Um, so we have to go through there. If you're not a Palestinian citizen, even if you are Palestinian, you can land in Tel Aviv Airport. You will get interrogated. You will get interrogated for sure. Um, but you'll you'll get you'll get through easier. Like you can just fly in. 
instead of having to go through Jordan and then a bunch of border controls, three border securities and getting on to, to the West Bank. But the thing is, while that might be easier and my dad can visit Jerusalem and he can visit the occupied areas because he's t documented wise not a Palestinian citizen. But the thing is, and you can say, oh, well, why don't you do that? Wouldn't you want to see your, your historic homeland? Wouldn't you want to see where your, where your grandparents, you know, uh, are from, where they worked, where they went on vacation? Well, don't you want to see that and how beautiful it is? And it really is beautiful. But doing that eliminates our identity. You have less Palestinian passports, less citizenships. That's kind of what you want right. to happen. Mm -hmm. That's kind of how you get rid of them. Right. You get rid of the stragglers. At that point, whatever you know, knew as Palestine just becomes a museum or just like a little artifact or ruins. That, that's figuratively how it'll start to seem. Yeah, um, yeah basically, you, you don't want your history to be lost. As much as I want to, to see these old areas, these very historic areas that I would love, love to go to. And I would love to go back go to Jerusalem whenever I want. But I can't sacrifice my identity to someone else you know this is this is how we resist this is the sacrifice we pay we literally put ourselves on, under so much pressure and go through all this traumatic events and ptsd that we go through just for the sake of of, of our flag yeah and i think that that's what sort of this is accomplishing. I know that you say you don't know the future and Palestinians might feel a certain way towards that, but I don't think you ever came in here with the mentality of like, I have the solution, this is what's gonna happen. No. I think that what you're doing is talking about what the facts are and, and what your experiences are. And so how do you hope to continue to keep your roots alive um, as you go forward? Man, I mean, every day it could be, it could be uh, you know, through, even something as simple as sharing on, on Instagram stories, you could share like, you know, you can share articles about that, spread information, raise awareness. And I always tell people, again, I know I might sound biased, but this is from my experience and what I faced. I can I can show you these things. I can show you these documents. What's your favorite thing about Palestine? Man, I, the, the history. I like I, I just I just like how every step I, I take don't know in if everybody Palestine. Would say the history. Well, the, 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 the history in the sense that like old how history. how grand like it really was how yeah, yeah, yeah. it was so, it's the most contested piece of real estate on earth and so every step i take in palestine i think i'm walking in the steps of like empires i'm walking in the steps of roman soldiers i'm walking in the steps of religious figures that's incredible and you know i'll go to jerusalem and i'm like man you know jesus or prophet isa like really did walk this yeah that's crazy mm -hmm. to think i've noticed that uh, a lot of times for food specifically yeah. for um they've taken things on as like israeli salad right. or israeli this yeah. and a lot of times actually like food that's native to palestine mm -hmm. um and things that they've made how do you guys feel when they've like taken it and then slapped their name onto it or it's it's typically the same exact meal the same exact recipes things like that and i'm sure it goes beyond food yeah and i mean you know there are many many jewish people yes can trace their roots back to the middle east and they, they can um and many of them did grow up grow up in the arab world yes they, they they did there has always been a jewish presence in this area there has always been a jewish presence in the area now, in terms of in terms of the food, yeah, a lot of us would get really mad when they when they would claim like hummus or a falafel or a shawarma, uh, you know, we we would. And I mean, there was like this funny video I saw, and it was uh, how to make Palestinian hummus and how to make Israeli hummus. And so for the Palestinian hummus, he goes through the entire recipe, like he goes through like all the garlic you gotta use, the chickpeas. He goes through this entire recipe and he's like, now you have Palestinian hummus. Uh, and then now I'm going to show you how to make Israeli hummus. Just say it's yours. Oh. <laughs> oh, no. that's, that's you, you could edit that out if you want. That's no, that's great story. But it's, hey, it, I didn't make the video. It's just, yeah, yeah. I didn't make the video. Mm -hmm. <laughs> There's a lot of videos like this. Yeah. Or so. um, I got to ask, how do you, uh, do you have any expectations from celebrities like DJ Khaled, Fousey Tube, Gigi and Bella Hadid to uh, talk about anything or do anything. So, sort of justice. so while they have maybe mentioned Palestine in the past and their roots, I've 
and I don't, maybe I don't know. Maybe not everything is documented. Mm -hmm. Maybe it doesn't have to be documented, you know, sure. to show how good they are. But let's say, let's say they're not really speaking. Let, let's just say they're not speaking or they're not doing much. I, I feel like I'm sure they're, they're proud of who they are. But I think like their platform is so huge that they can do a lot with it. You know, they can spread awareness. Even if there's one rapper that has, it was Vic Mensa actually. Mm. Vic Mensa actually went to the occupied West Bank. He went to Hebron. Oh, wow. Hebron is the most, wow. uh, Hebron is the biggest city in the West Bank. It is one of, if you want to see what we call the occupation or apartheid in front of you, go to that city. So what did uh, Vic Mensa do? Here? So Vic Mensa actually um, did go out to go out to the West Bank and he saw he saw the pain he saw we have a separation wall by the way trump talks about a wall i lived with a wall there is a huge wall that separates uh, palestinians from israelis and it was put up to avoid uh you know terrorist acts by palestinians and all of that yeah i i get like maybe it'll uh, reduce it'll help security and reduce uh, terrorist acts but what it ended up doing was destroying a lot of like people palestinian people's livelihoods as well uh, you know, there's people's schools on the other side, there's people's businesses on the other side. It's much taller and much wider than the Berlin Wall and has much more security than the Berlin Wall ever was. Wow. Now, yesterday was the first Friday prayer of Ramadan. And the Al-Aqsa Mosque is the third holiest site in Islam. The Al-Aqsa Mosque gets like, there are Israeli settlers and soldiers that will start going into, the, into our area and just kind of messing with us. Maybe not so much the the soldiers, but the settlers in the West Bank are very like they come, they can come off as pretty aggressive. And there's been many problems with Palestinian villagers and settlers. Um, and it's just like, hey, you know, we're trying to pray. And there are many times that Friday prayer has been shut down mm. at the third holy site in Islam. So the Palestinians ended up ending up having to pray somewhere else in Jerusalem. Mm. Not even like, like their quarter, the Muslim quarter that they, that you know is so holy to them, they they can't do that. I saw this picture yesterday, and it was guys climbing the wall. They were literally climbing the wall to sneak into Jerusalem so that they could go pray. You can get killed for that. You can get arrested. You can get killed for that. But that's again, that's the sacrifice we pay just to be ourselves. I think there's a lot of, um, you know, similar stories and, and experiences that we could really go on for a while about. Um, I do want to end on a good note. Yeah. And uh, I want to know what is it that kind of keeps your spirit alive and what do you love about the Palestinian people? I love that they're strong. I love that the people that have never stepped foot in Palestine, including the Hadids up until like recently, I think their brother uh, recently went and he's been posting a lot about it and how, again, how like the strength and you know how resilient they really are like these people don't give up Th these people like that's crazy that they are like top models yeah world renowned and they do that even like selena gomez was um you know standing up against uh, uh for standing up for the palestinians zayn malik did at one point like mm -hmm. there are some people at lupe fiasco yeah um so and so i, I need i need to tell you guys now we call it occupation. A lot of people don't want to hear the word occupation. Mm -hmm. But let me tell you this. There is no Palestinian that is for occupation. There's many Jewish people in Israel and out of Israel that are against occupation. And then there's many Israeli people that are for it. Mm -hmm. Now, let me tell you, look at that. You have two groups against occupation, including a large Jewish community, many in the U.S., many in Israel as well. There's many moderate... You know, there's many Israelis that don't like this conflict. They they just don't like it. They they want us all to be they want us all to be together. And I guess with younger generations, you know, they they want to avoid the problems of their ancestors. Um, as tough as it is, but there are people that are really trying to move forward and trying to. And that's why you have Jewish people against Israel. They're what they're saying is they're not self-hating Jewish people. They are Jews that hate Zionism. They don't like the Zionist ideology and how it has has you know done this to this community. 
there's there's many like that. You know, Arabs and Jewish people are cousins technically. Which is, which is not brand. a foreign idea to yeah. us, as we discussed yeah. before, how Muslims feel a lot of times about Saudi Arabia and, and countries that right. prioritize money and royalty before the actual uh, people, and, people and humanity. Right. And money does run the world in that case. It and does. Sometimes that's how it goes. But um, yeah, I mean, I, I have to say, like, before I had Palestinian friends, uh, especially in like uh, through college, I thought that Pakistanis were the most uh, proud people. I mean, you have a good amount of Pakistani people. Pakistanis, yeah. like, yeah. they're crazy. But... Uh, the Palestinian people, I have to say, like it's it's beautiful to see a a, a culture just as strong. If anybody wants to know any more information or anything, do you want to put your social media out there or any uh, resources yeah. that yeah, for sure. they can contact? Yeah, or, so or it's uh, at Haith Hawks, H A I T H, and then Hawks. Okay, cool. One word. And we'll we'll link that in the description if you want to hit him up and and get to know more of his story or anything like that. Right. Um, we leave the podcast with one question we ask the guests every single time. And uh, Shamir will ask that for you. If you could describe yourself in any flavor, what flavor would it be and why? I would say peanut butter chocolate. Oh, who's ready? I had, yeah. I had this. Re- I watched this podcast, man. Hey. <laughs> I had this ready because you know, you know, before peanut butter and chocolate were ever mixed, it was always like, ah, why, why? I like this separate. I like this separate. It's like ah, but I think with me is I do appreciate my culture. I do appreciate my religion. I do appreciate you know being an American as well, that I can do that. And, you know, we, we people who are either immigrants or come from immigrant families, we have something called dual loyalty. Now it's to America and to the places we're from. Mm-hmm. Now those people we're loyal to, they might not always agree with each other and they might butt heads a lot, but either way, like you appreciate something about them. Um, if you go somewhere else, you know, you might start repping America a lot. Mm. That's beautiful, actually. Like that's a that's a great answer. Yeah. And and you do support a lot of what we do, so I have to say thank you. Yeah, uh, he, for sure. He does listen thank to the podcast <laughs> and everything. And and honestly, thank you, Hatham, for like coming on here and telling your story. I think that's extremely yeah. brave. I think that's like you know people will learn a lot from that. So overall, just like thank you for thank you for being here. Yeah, for sure. Thank you for having me. And uh, for everybody listening, thank you for listening to another episode of Strange Flavors. It's been another week. Another flavor. A little less stranger. We'll talk to you next. Time.